I don't even have it on. Okay, and I'll just I'll uh I might have to do this all over again. I hope not. Let's see. Uh -oh. Uh, I think sometimes when I let it sit in the queue for too long. Nope, I think, Peter, I think we are live, dear boy. Excellent. I think. You think? Let's see. I think. Should I, should I turn on Facebook? <laughs> I'm kind of afraid to. Um, Let's see, uh, how would I find it now? Oh, there it we are. Be... Yeah, we're, li we're live. All right. There we are. Who do we have watching? Let's well, see. maybe too soon to, to say. I'm bringing my page. I see there's 11 people so watching you, earnestly. How often do you do this, John? Um, I've been doing it twice a week, Wednesday and Saturday or Sunday. You look good, Pete. You look I great. Good. Actually. I feel good. Thanks. Twice a week. That's how often a lot of people out there are, are, are showering these days. <laughs> I think, you know, here's here's what I do. Um, if anyone's interested, I, I decided that having a bit of a routine uh, would be helpful. So, um, you know, I found some uh, some clippers and, and so I, I cut my own hair. I trim my beard. I I shave just about every day. Um, I yep. don't wear pajamas. I don't even walk around in shorts. I like to get dressed up and um I'm a little bit uh, too production or goal oriented for my own good, I think. But um, you know, I I have a to do list, and I'm getting all sorts of things done. I mean, I'm catching up like crazy. Uh, the home repair uh, stuff has has, uh, has has been a lot of fun. Um, I'm watching. Are a you lot pretty of YouTube pretty handy? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, a little bit. Um, uh, in in terms of being handy. Yeah. Um. And uh, we ventured out and braved uh, visits to one of the local hardware stores. Uh, in one of them, uh, the, the salesman. Oh, listen to that. Oh. Sorry, that's my ring. Uh, I'll turn my sound off here. Apologies. By the way, um, Steve Edelson's daughter, uh, Laura, is watching. And she says hello Hi, to both Laura. of us. Hi, Laura. Oh. Good to see you watching good to see you watching although i can't see you but i miss you i sure miss your dad yeah uh, me too he was such a great friend and such an important part of 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 what we do um he, he <laughs> i would love to to see and hear what he would make of all this right now oh man i know i can imagine he he he, he you know god bless steve he he wouldn't be enjoying it as much as other people <laughs> to put it mildly <laughs> well steve did love his restaurants and he he, he, he took me to uh, many great ones yeah uh, but, uh, getting back to the discussion of, of yeah. being handy around around the house uh well one uh, needs to be these days and uh so you know yeah. preparing the, the the gas range or or uh, uh, f fixing the this that or the other and and it's it's fun you know um and i'm i'm keeping a little <laughs> i'm documenting like yeah uh, the, the things i've fixed that's really boring but <laughs> no that's great i i was just gonna say i'm not handy and and my sister-in-law is watching right now tracy and she tracy's would have tracy uh, tracy's tracy's probably more handy than i am she she takes care of a farm and uh but Kelly's more handy than I am in a lot of ways. I mean, it's, I can, you know, I can, I can change the screen door when the, when the weather changes and I take that's, out a mean uh, bag of trash. That's, and, uh, that's saying a lot. I mean, you know, <laughs> screen door, that's, yeah. I, I try not to mess with doors too much. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the big news here is uh, we're getting a puppy. And, oh, wow. It, it's not just the uh, uh, coronavirus uh, puppy thing. Uh, we've been wanting to get a dog for some time now, and the opportunity came up. And, and she was the one female puppy out of a litter of, of seven. She has six brother puppies. Oh, that's great. And uh, we've already named her. And her name will be Minnie, like Minnie, Minnie Mouse or 
yeah, spelled Minnie Mouse, not like Minnie yeah. Minnie. Uh, and she's she's very sweet. Uh, so I've been ordering little uh, dog toys and, and all sorts of puppy things from Amazon. <laughs> That's exciting. <laughs> it is. I'm That's looking great. forward to it. Uh, she's going to uh, she's going to come to her new home on Sunday, and uh, the puppy training will begin. So, so how old and, is, how old is she, Pete? She's just... uh, she'll be uh, eight weeks when we okay. When we get her. Yeah. yeah, right. And I guess that's how you're supposed to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll be fun. Uh, it, and, uh, you know, my wife and I, Lindsay and I, have been exercising every morning. And, um, you know, this this will be the first summer, and indeed it's the first period of spring, you know, the month of May, uh, that I've been home in years. Uh, yeah. Right now, I was supposed to be in uh, Hungary, uh, just wrapping up a, uh, a drum festival gig there mm -hmm. uh, in Cheglad, where the incredible uh, drum museum is located. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. And, and I would have done a tour with uh, uh, with my trio, um, like everyone else. So you know, all the live work is canceled until who knows when, and. Um, you know, it's funny uh, when things happen in life. You know, the, the, the small things happen, you can get annoyed. Or, but when the big things happen, the, the the sense of gravity, I think, hits you right away. And yeah, um, and 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 that accompanying kind of sense of calm. Mm -hmm. and it's like, all right, well, this is this is what it is, and now, what do we do? Um, so uh, aside from the horror of, 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 of what's happening to anyone who is unfortunate enough to, to catch the virus or, or the unbelievable sacrifices being made by all the frontline workers, um, uh, you know, for those of us who, who are healthy and, and, and who can stay home and, and are happy to be home, uh, I mean, I feel very lucky that, you know, Mitzi and I, are, we're not confined to a one or two bedroom apartment. We, we have a backyard. I've, I've got my music studio here. So uh, I'm more than, than fortunate. I don't, I don't count myself as being inconvenienced in, in any manner, even, even though I, I lost all my work, uh, mm -hmm. save for... Uh, yeah, you know, the, the the teaching gig at USC. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, you know, what a great opportunity to to do all sorts of things. Yeah. What, I, what, what are you doing? <laughs> Besides this. Yeah. I uh, well, you know, I'd I'd like to say that I've been taking this time to play more, to practice more, which is what I should be doing. But um, I, I've told this story a couple of times. You know, Kelly and I live in a in a condo. I've had very forgiving neighbors who, on a, on, in a typical situation, while I'm home during the day, I can play. They don't, they don't mind it on either side of me. And it's a pretty, um, you know, it's, it's not your typical sort of con. It's more like a townhouse, three levels. I'm on the third floor. So I think a lot of the sound is going out. But we do have a neighbor on either side. And I've, I've spoken to both of them and said in the past, you know, if, it, if it's ever too much, just tell me. And they're, no, I, we can hardly hear you. And it's great to hear it. And, but with Kelly home during the day, it's different because at a point, she's kind of like, OK, that's enough, you know, with, with the drums. So, so for, I for a while, you know what I'm saying? So I, I um, so for a while, I, uh, I wasn't really playing much at all. I mean, I was playing on a practice pad and kind of going out of my mind so I bought some of those Remo silent stroke heads mm. um, a few weeks ago and I put those on one of my sets and I liked them at first and I love Remo so this is nothing I, but I'm just not loving really the idea of just how quiet and you know what I mean you've, you've used them right it, it's like yeah we, mesh, we well know. we we uh, we have to use them in one of our classrooms at, at USC yeah. So uh, we're good neighbors, and uh, you know, uh, for for what I have to demonstrate to the students, they work fine. We tried using them in the practice rooms, and and none of the students uh, like 
you know, playing on those compared to being able to yeah. viscerally experience the drums. And, and um, you know, what, uh, what you could do, if, I mean, if you can find those times of the day when it's okay to play, um, uh, use this as a time to uh, work on playing the drums softly. Um, yeah. And, yep. and work on, on those things. Uh, and, and there's always plenty of stuff to work on. You know, it's funny. Um, if a neighbor is, uh, you know, hanging a speaker outside their window or, or uh, somehow, uh, you know, with, with a open door or window, I'm hearing a, a, the sound of a movie playing or, or the radio or, or something. Um, that's always annoying to me. But if I hear, you know, someone practicing, you know, saxophone, trombone, whatever, um, it never bothers me. Yeah, I, I know that, what you mean. Yeah. The, the sound of someone practicing has never bothered me. Whatever time of day, it's just, maybe it's because, you know, where I went to high school at Interlochen Arts Academy, the practice rooms were below uh, our dorm rooms. And... It was, you just always heard people practicing and not just one person practicing. You would hear, you know, a trombone player, an oboe player, a piano player, uh, maybe someone singing. Uh, and uh, it just all, it, you know, it's for me, that's sort of a beautiful thing to hear yeah. someone practicing. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't mind it too much. But the, the drums are, how do we put it? The drums do beg the patience of, yeah, with those around us, I think. And and in my wife's defense, I I know that um, the, the setup that we have here that it's it's mainly the bass drum that really kind of rattles the house. And if she she can if she's just trying to watch a movie or something, she's been really patient about it. Though she will say, yeah, you know, I'll I'll, I'll put some music on or something. And um, <laughs> but I just I, I I will say that on a, on a much more exciting note, I just started last week. Um, studying with a, a, a local drummer friend of mine named Chris Anzalone, who might actually be watching, but maybe not, but um, another left-handed drummer. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been oh. friends for, for years. And, and, uh, and he, I just, he happened to mention at one point, I think I saw it on Facebook that he was starting to do online lessons. So I, I reached out and I said, I'd love to just, um, you know, I, I, I studied a little bit for a short time many years ago and got some very basics on reading and I'd love to sort of revisit that and and just be able to make my way through a chart, you know, and, and uh, or write a chart if I needed to learn a song quick for a gig tomorrow night or something. And, and I just thought it would be good for me to just kind of tune up a little bit, so. Okay, well, uh, of course, and I have to ask and or recommend uh, do you have the Louis Belson reading book? I don't have that book. I have I have stick control and syncopation, and I just bought um, another book. But all right, the two books I'm going to recommend. Okay. Um, for bass drum studies, the Colin Bailey book is just the best, oh. and I really wish that I'd been hip to that when I was a younger drummer. Um, but there's no better method for getting your right foot, indeed, getting all your limbs, but it's mm -hmm. it's uh, just uh, uh, beautifully written and it's and, and, and the way it's implemented this whole systematic ah excuse me hi mutsi hi john <laughs> how are you it's good to see you good to see you <laughs> all right bye. bye i'll see you see ya. well everybody there's our special guest yes <laughs> <laughs> Mutsi erskine our special guest our, our special guest um, okay, so the Colin, the Colin Bailey book is great. Yeah, and then the uh, the Louis Belson book. Now, I wasn't going to unveil this quite yet, but when um, when I'm when I'm reading the Belson book, and and the genius of the Louis Belson book is that Louis took rhythms that more or less sound the same or might be identical sounding but he writes them in different ways using different combinations of note lengths or rests. Um, and depending on how quickly you've set the metronome or, or your, the tempo that you're reading this stuff at, um, 
you uh, you really learn uh, to to not only recognize every possible kind of permutation of, of a rhythm, but you learn to look ahead because the only way that you can really sight read is you know if, if this is your tempo like one two three four bump bump bump. And as I'm as I'm there on beat three of the music, I've read that I'm already at the next measure. Yeah. And and when I get you know halfway through the final measure of of, of a stave or a line, I'm already down at the next line while I'm playing. So you learn to kind of be in two places at once. And uh, my 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 good friend Mark Beecher, who's the president of the National Association of Rudimental Drummers. And he and his wife do all the design work for fuzzy music. I I, uh, I found myself, you know, I was always saying, always be looking ahead to my students at USC. This became this thing. And uh, he came up with a logo. Oh, I love that. And I we're going that. we're going to do something with this. I, we have hats, shirts. Um, I'm I'm going to get in touch with with teachers around I mean, you know and I have no no pony in, in this horse race I have no interest in in the Belsen okay. book other than it's just the greatest uh, resource available for working yes, okay with me. and if you if, if you and uh, if we get enough feedback uh, before we finish our session here I'll show you how I use it and not only just sight reading rhythms but how I use it at the kit. I love that. Yeah. Um, okay. That that'll yeah. be that'll be fun to do. Now you 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 of course uh, uh, when you mentioned the special guest, I appreciate that you referred to Mutsi as that. But we do have a special guest. Who we do be joining us. Is, is he in the waiting room? He's in the waiting room. I can let him in. Shall I? I think we should uh, we okay. should let him in. What do you say, folks? Folks, we uh, there's a 20 second delay, but let's see what what people are saying about letting the special guest in. You know, Pete, if they know who it is, they may not want him in. But, <laughs> well, <laughs> and I know, I know he'll think that's funny because he he has a great sense of humor like you and me. Um, I was just going to say too, Michael Vosbeen is watching our friend Michael, hey, Michael. Vosbeen, and uh, he had asked about um, us really mainly you uh he was i think being polite talking to me but just to talk about symbols so maybe maybe we'll invite the guest in and make him uh be part of that discussion too so sure um, sure yeah uh, um uh, what what's the consensus do do we let the guest in we'll see everyone is is um, no idea tom, who he is. yeah tom evans said uh and i think he said unless it's mick unless it's rick Murata, <laughs> no <laughs> or something or, or maybe he went oh will lee says yeah so i guess we gotta let him in <laughs> okay all right here he comes drum roll please let's see that that guy wherever he is uh, how do you like my drum roll that's a darn good drum roll and there, there he is, is. <laughs> me, to me to introduce myself. <laughs> Pro Professor von Helsing. Or how about an egg roll? <laughs> Cats. <laughs> oh, Adam, you got to turn your, your Facebook. Uh, yeah, good. All systems are go. Get oh. that crazy delay. <laughs> it's great to see you, Cats. Thank it's great you. to see you, too. too. I was uh, lost in a little bit of a digitotic uh, delay, but I think we're uh, aqueduct for our purposes. We're good now. Uh, the, the painting behind you uh, <laughs> uh, on the wall, is that, is that uh, one of your father's? Absolutely. It's wonderful. Oh, Thank it's beautiful. You. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm very fortunate to have, I mean, my house is pretty empty now because I'm preparing the but uh, I have a lot of lovely artwork in the house and sculptures and all sorts of things that are very motiv motivating for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, motivating. Nice. It's important right now to have things that motivate you. 
Yeah, yes, I know. Yeah, I know what you mean. Think, uh, I was, although I don't have any visual skills, I think the aesthetic of growing up in an environment with all this had a deep impact on me. So, positively, I uh, I I rely more on uh, you know memories like uh, going to the World's Fair. Nineteen thirty nine, Peter. No, the nineteen sixty four. Oh, I remember that. And then my little uh, uh, gremlin or gnome, I, I, I call him Noam Chomsky. <laughs> <laughs> no conspiracies here. Um, I, got, I got him to uh, celebrate the holidays, uh, you know, at Christmas time. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, so, uh, uh, so what's the weather like back east, gang? What's it like? Here it's about 60 and sunny, a little windy near the water, but but pretty nice. Yeah. Going to get warmer. How about out in L.A.? Same in Pennsylvania, Adam? It's good there? Well, I'm in New York. I'm oh, you're still in New York. Okay. Um, well, L.A., it's uh, it, it quite nice today. It started yeah. off a little... Well, yeah, actually, it was yesterday we had a bit of the June gloom kind of thing going uh, mm -hmm. uh, kind of in and out all during the day, but it's very sunny today and it's beautiful i was out for my morning walk this morning and it was about 48 degrees mm -hmm. but, but you know you go out there you hit it for an hour you get warmed up so yeah i yeah. could only get these to feel that good <laughs> yeah i did a little run this morning it was about 50 when i got out there but with the wind it felt colder but i i warmed up behind you or in front of you um Behind me on my way out, I ran two and almost two and a quarter miles out, and then back I had it in my face. Excellent, yeah. excellent. So raise your hand if you're if you're practicing. Come on, Adam. I know you're playing every day. <laughs> um, well, you know, while I have you two, well, sorry, Pete. I was going to say, well, I have two literal experts on symbols at the same time. Um, and just because Michael Vosbeen had asked about um, talking about symbols, I was going to just throw it out there. Is there maybe anything you guys would want to talk about in terms of how you picked your symbols, how you okay, how I'll, you like them cooked? I'll 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 start with the uh, uh, about choosing a symbol. Um, you know, obviously, uh, it helps if you have. Uh, some kind of an idea or sound in your head or imagination, what, what you might be looking for. Um, so, you know, that makes it a lot easier for your radar to kind of direct you or, or, or help you dial in uh, what you want to hear. Uh, but let's just say you're, uh, you're interested in finding a ride symbol. Um, the, the, the one thing that, that I learned to do over the years especially if you have the luxury of, of trying, you know, uh, a number of symbols, more than just one or two, let's say, um, mm -hmm. is that I would, I'd set up two symbol stands and I'll play the two symbols and I'll choose one or the other. And then there's no looking back. And then you just set, set the, uh, the symbol that you did not choose to the side and, and move forward. Because otherwise, if you just like, well, maybe mm, I don't. Yeah, yeah. I like that one, but I also like that. It, you can go crazy pretty quick. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, it helps to, you know, have the your drumstick that you like to play, so you can hear how it sounds. And then you need to have someone play it whose touch you know or trust, so mm -hmm. you can hear it um, across the room. Because um, a lot of a lot of symbols, especially with my students at school, I noticed uh, for a while they were like really getting into the boutique symbol kind of thing. These very dry, kind of hip sounding symbols that sounded really cool, you know, right on top when you played them, but they didn't project. And so I would go to, uh, to gigs or recitals and I just couldn't hear, couldn't hear the time. Um, so just off the top of my head, that's my couple of caveats regarding symbols. Excellent, you, excellent advice. Well, I basically concur 
Um, at the end of the day, though, I have to have the music around the symbol. It has to be done within the context of having music around it. Because sometimes I've been in a situation where I hear a symbol and it seems quite satisfying. But then once I get the music around it, I got to hear how it's inside the music, mm -hmm. how it allows me to hear around what it's trying to provide. You know, we're trying to provide a rhythmic foundation, a cushion. Um, I think you brought up a very good point. Sometimes you'll hear a symbol and it'll be satisfying when you're on top of it, but not when you're out in the audience. And I've also experienced vice versa, where I hear something from out in the crowd and it sounds fantastic, but when I'm playing it, it's not giving it to me. Mm -hmm. So that's also been a situation that's occurred on several occasions. But I've also had symbols that don't sound all that great by themselves. But when you get the music around it, it seems to get right in there. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's very important that you have in your mind's ear a concept of a sound. Mm -hmm. And everybody has a different touch. I have done this on occasion where I would hear cymbals. I remember they called me up at Manny's one time, Gary Carnavale, who was working there at one point. He called me, he goes, hey, Adam, they found a bunch of... Uh, old K's at the Gretsch warehouse. Why didn't you come on down? Woo. So what did I do? I called up Mel Lewis. I said, Hey Mel, let's go out for lunch and come with me to Manny's. He said, great idea. So he played it. I played it. We went back and forth and that was something cause I also respected his uh, input. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, at the, I've also had symbols where when I've got what them, happened, what happened? I mean, you so we bought three. I bought three symbols. Okay. What year was this, Adam? Was this around eighty three, eighty four, maybe? It Do was early eighties. At some point, um, I remember I, I paid one hundred and sixty dollars per symbol, which was pretty cheap at that time. Was it ever? But it's not as cheap as my first two A's that I got, which were when I was about 12. I got my 20 and my 18 for $39 and $33 at Manny's. <laughs> hey, hold that thought because I just want to, I got two th quick things I'm just reading here. First of all, James Mobley would like to know what Peter and Adam's favorite rides are. But <clears throat> I also want to read you this comment from Ralph Humphrey, our dear friend. Uh, and Ralph says, the sound of the symbol in its context is very important, what Adam just said. That is why one symbol is not enough in one's metal arsenal. Spoken by the Ralph Humphrey. Thank you, Ralph. This is true. Good to see you watching. Yep. Um, so, yeah. Um, I, and I know this, this, the answer to this question could change literally a half hour from now. But, and I know both of you, and I know that's actually the, the case for real, but like Pete, what's your favorite ride symbol at the moment? I, it, you know, uh, I, I have a, a one Carope I really like, and and I have an Avidus that I'm super fond of. But ultimately, I, I, it seems that I'll go back to the 22 medium Constantinople. That's just that's the one that that's the most versatile uh, ride for me, and. And then on the left, either an 18 or 19 inch, like either Sweet Ride, you know, when, uh, I mean, the Armin, you know, Beautiful mm -hmm. Baby Ride, the 19, the ride. three rivets. Uh, I also have an Avidus. And then uh, Paul Francis sent me an incredible 18 inch prototype, uh, again, with the three rivets. Uh, it's just so much fun. Mm. Um, so, I mean, all the, all the symbols uh, as of late, uh, whether they're the Coropes or the Avidus um, or a couple of these new prototypes, they, they just are all such a, a, a joy to play on. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not wanting it all in, in, in the symbol department. What's your favorite, Adam? Well, as of late, I've been using a prototype, which is basically a 21-inch Renaissance that's been overhammered. And I've been digging that. And at the same time, I can go back to my 22 Renaissance 
Uh, the other day I pulled out my 22 original pre-aged. Mm. And that baby's been yeah. coming down a lot. So it's definitely mellowed down, which is something that happens after a cymbal is played over years and years. And uh, I like to have, you know, basically two different cymbals. You know, sometimes I'm using a 20 inch Renaissance over here. I also have a weird 19 inch mutant that I think was run over <laughs> because I think when I, the symbol came, it was in the winter and UPS left the uh, package in the driveway. I think it snowed. My wife may have run over it. I don't know, but it's got a nice warp in it. And that symbol sounds wonderful. So that's a 19. But I have to agree with Peter, the consistency factor now has gotten so high where even though they may all have a little different character, they're all very good. Yeah. It, it, Paul has been just magnificent with his ability to make a consistently good product. And I think you need to have an instrument that's going to have enough flexibility that allows you with the options of your touch to access different sounds. Yeah. yeah. It, it can be years to learn how to play a cymbal. I mean, when I was younger, I would hit a cymbal. And I will confess that in my youth, I cracked old K's, which was just my well, stupidity of trying to hit them and not learning how to play them. And over time, you have to learn how to get that touch together. And you have to have a sound enough in your head. And yeah. if you believe that sound enough, you're going to be able to get it. I mean, I'll never forget the one night I heard Elvin sit on on Omar Hakim's drum set. And in four beats, it sounded like he was playing his drum kit. Yeah. And it yeah. couldn't have been more different. And it was like, oh, damn. Woo. I got chills. And then you realize it's the painter, not the brush. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, speaking of Alvin, um, and you, we always wonder about, you know, do symbols age? Do they mellow? Um, back when I was a kid, the the the, uh, the the mythology was you could you know bury a symbol in your in your backyard, and that would somehow um, do something to it. But but Alvin did something that was very interesting. Um, I was in Istanbul. This was in. Uh, late summer of 1985 and we were invited to the original Zildjian factory in Istanbul uh, and Elvin was also playing at this festival so I kind of felt like I was tagging along and I you know so anyway they, uh, there uh, there were two symbol stands two symbols a pair of hats and no drum set and normally when any of us will, will play a cymbal, we'll kind of, you know, ting, 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 whatever. Uh, Elvin took the two sticks and he just started rolling on it. And he continued rolling on this one cymbal. And this is like for like two minutes, he's rolling on it and it's really loud. And he's starting to sweat and he's starting to smile. And it's just this roaring sound. And then all of a sudden he's, he was satisfied and he started playing it. And, and he wanted to open it up and I'd never seen yeah. anybody do that. <clears throat> um, and Adam, I, you're talking about the chills. I could hear the Coltrane Quartet with him just playing the cymbal and the hi hat, uh, and and he he was you know digging the cymbals and and um, it, it was quite something to to see and hear. Well, it always was with Elvin. Yeah, yeah. Um, Peter, I just a quick question from Michael Myers asking if you'll ever have a, another company uh, create your standalone stick bag. It's my favorite bag. Uh, thank you. That that was a fun um, uh, fun thing to come up with, and and 
the good folks at Yamaha. It was actually Fred Beto who helped us build the first prototype, and and he was making them for Yamaha. Uh, and hmm. then when I left Yamaha and uh, uh, started playing the DW drums, and DW had a line of accessories. Um, unfortunately, uh, the 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 uh, the nature of of that deal, uh, I pretty much kind of signed away the design rights uh, to get the bag made there. So uh, I've just kind of moved on from it. I saw there was some company that came out with a floor-based uh, stick bag that the Sabian company, I think, was distributing. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't, I mean, it looked uh, not nearly as sturdy and it didn't have the table uh, function. It, it just it was was a was a stick bag that would, would stay up on the floor. It's a valid idea. I mean, you know, uh, floor toms definitely would sound different with or without a bag on it. Um, I think as, as as I've gotten older, I just, yeah, I just put the stick bag hanging on the floor tom and don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, but when I was <laughs> in my thirties and forties, it seemed like a really great idea. <laughs> I remember that bag. It was a great idea. It was a very cool idea. Yeah, not bad. Not always bad. thinking. Always thinking. Always thinking. Always thinking. Hey, hey, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna grab the floor just for a second because John had asked me in advance, Adam, if I had a Lenny Demuzio story. Yes. And and I've I've got a uh, I've got a good one. Now Let me get some water. I'm listening. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, <laughs> This uh, this is the summer of nineteen seventy seven. Okay. And I was playing the drums with Maynard Ferguson's band, and yep. there was a summer uh, NAM convention, the big music conference. Um, Chicago. That, that yep. used to be the big one. No, this was in Atlanta. Okay. Yep. And um, <clears throat> uh, as part of this whole uh, NAM show. Uh, the Zildjian Slingerland uh, Drum Company, Z Zildjian Cymbals, uh, and Holton, and they made uh, Maynard's uh, trumpet. Uh, the three of them sponsored this pretty big deal concert. And so it was one of the big evening concerts. And, and back in those days, there weren't as many competing events. That was kind of like that was it. That was that was yeah. it for that night. So it was it was jam packed and every everyone was there and, and it was an, an exciting evening. And I I believe it was afterwards, um, a bunch of us decided to go out uh, to some uh, club nightclub, mm -hmm. and a band was playing, uh, and. Uh, the, they're all seated at a long table. So it's Armin Zildjian, Lenny Demuzio, uh, Maynard Ferguson, um, some other people. Uh, it, things are getting rowdy kind of quickly. I think Lenny went over uh, and and tipped whoever needed to be tipped, you know, a couple hundred bucks, whatever. And he's like, fine, you, 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 you all have fun, do whatever you like. So they're ordering champagne and... Um, now I'm I'm finding out about a lot of this after the fact because the band was so good, uh, and and our good friend Robbie Gonzalez was playing the drums. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. So Robbie Robbie's playing the drums. He's very gracious, uh, allows me to sit in. So I have my back to all this, uh, but meanwhile uh, Maynard uh, and Armand uh, they invite a woman who was with her date at another table, and they're getting annoyed by all the commotion. Anyway, they invite her. You know, to, you know dance for us. Uh, my dear. Uh, so she gets up on top of the table and begins dancing. And and the dance takes on, well, you, you can imagine the kind of dancing she uh, winds up doing. Uh, so it's it's just a wild, wild night. And 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 I remember at the at the end of the evening, Lenny Demuzio passed out of my hotel room. Um, and I'm kind of trying to pull him, get him under the covers, you know, take his shoes off, whatever. Uh, there, were, there were two beds in the room. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so a couple of years later, we're back in Atlanta. Uh, this is maybe like four years later or something. Um, 
and uh, at this point I'm, I'm down there doing something with Yamaha drums and uh, it, it, this this evening back in 1977 had taken on sort of epic proportions uh, you know, in terms of oh, yeah. music industry mythology yeah and uh, and so I was like hey let's see if that club's still there let's see if you know it's like there's a band and what's like you know let's let's go back there and so it's uh, Armand isn't with us but it's Lenny and a bunch of drummers and we all want this you know uh, mojo to, to like happen again and so we get a table right in front of the band and there's a band playing and we order a bunch of drinks and we're really trying our darndest to like you know like get the the thing <laughs> happening yeah, but yeah. we can't really and and the guy who is the singer with the band, and he's, uh, I don't know if any of you remember, like Gary Puckett and the Union. Oh, yeah. Guy. So sure, he's, yeah. he's this Gary Puckett-looking kind of guy. Yeah, and, Vegas. And, and, yeah. and he, believe me, with hindsight, I, I get his point of view. But at the time, I didn't quite appreciate it. But, you know, he's taking this thing very seriously. And, um, and we're making a lot of noise. And drinking and, and we're, we're trying too hard to have fun it's one of those tables okay. yeah yeah <laughs> anyway um while we're trying to trying really hard to have fun uh this guy stops between tunes and on mic he goes uh excuse me are you all here with the uh with the music convention and we realize he's talking to us and we're like yeah yeah that's us yeah we are you know and we were so happy to be recognized we think all right something's gonna happen and he looks at us and he kind of leans in. He goes, well, don't forget. It's people like us that keep people like you in business. <laughs> so <laughs> we all kind of look to Lenny because he's our father <laughs> figure here. And, and Lenny stands up with this drink and he goes, hey, pal. He goes, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> and he turns... <laughs> He turned, there he is, and he turns to us, he goes, come on, fellas, let's get out of here. <laughs> so we became this wandering band of Ronin, uh, uh, just you know, pleasure seekers with no place to go, and we finally just all disappeared. And at the, probably ended up at the bar of the hotel, kind of, you know, and, and I'm I guessing. Come on, we'll get a few pops, we'll have a great time. Maybe that was that. You know, that might have been the year that Lenny passed out of my room. I, I, <laughs> I can't oh, remember now. Uh, anyway, uh, that's a great if, story. If, if that Gary Puckett looking dude by any chance is watching this, I years later I'd like to offer my apologies for for being an ass. You're a good man, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> but that's 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 uh, one of my Lenny stories. <laughs> Where do we begin with this guy? He was such a, oh, he was fantastic. What did somebody call him? Like an irreverent angel. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, so much fun, man. I think of Lenny all the time because my son, Lenny, Maynard, and Ron Carter were all born on May 4th. Right, right. So I always say, May the fourth be with you. I bet you do. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Lenny, he was a one in a row, man. Real treasure. Yeah. Uh, I, I was going to tell you a quick, I thought of this. I, I've told a lot of Lenny stories and these things I've done in the past. And I thought of one recently that I hadn't ever thought to tell, which is pretty good. And Adam, you might have been there. I don't think you were there, Pete. It was at Colin Schofield's wedding. In Connecticut. I wasn't there. You were there, Pete? Were you there? No. No, no. I wasn't. No. 90, 93, I think, almost 30 years ago. So it was a it was a destination wedding. But of course, I was there and Lenny and uh, Armand and actually, I don't know if Armand was able to make it. But anyway, there was a whole contingent of us there. And it was in August. It was really, really hot. And the night, I, I want to say it was the night. Yes, it was the night of the wedding. We were there for like a weekend. But I think... After the wedding, we they lost power at the reception hall, and the, they had a live band, and that you know half of the music had to get sidelined because they had no power there, and 
it was fine. But anyway, we, we go back to the hotel, at the, which is more like a motel. And uh, it's, I don't know, midnight or something. And it's still about 90 degrees, 95 degrees, really humid. And I had sort of been um, keeping an eye on Lenny, you know, just to make sure he was okay. And um, no, shoot, I'm sorry, guys. It wasn't the hotel. It was somewhere where there was a pool outside of... Uh-oh. Yeah. Anyway, there's a pool and Lenny decides he wants to go for a swim. <laughs> so he he strips down to his boxer shorts and there's a bunch of us there. He just he just stripped down to his boxer shorts and dove in the pool <laughs> and he was swimming around. And and I'm kind of like panicking, going, Lenny, Lenny, we're going to get in trouble. We got to, you know, somebody's going to call the cops, whatever. And he took a few laps, came out the comb over that he used to do you remember that that was like that had, had taken on a whole new sort of wow. thing on its own so but that was cool and he starts to put his clothes on and he's thinking i can't find my keys johnny i, I guess i hadn't driven him there so he's looking for his car keys so i'm thinking i'm gonna have to dive in this pool and look for his keys but then i thought well wait a minute no he he took his pants off so he didn't have his keys in his boxer shorts so we had like lighters or flashlights or something but looking around this this pool area and i'm thinking any minute the cops are going to show up and then finally it dawns on lenny that john king had left hours before with his car taking lenny's wife and john's wife back to the hotel so i said well lenny it's a good thing i stuck around because i'm your ride back to the hotel so anyway we we get in my car we drive back to the hotel and uh he couldn't remember what his room number was so I was going to let him stay in my room with me, but he he ended up thinking he remembered what room it was. And to, be, to God's honest truth, I just I kind of just walked down the hall with him and I left him. I just kind of went, you know, we'll 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 figure this out if you, if you need to call downstairs or something. But anyway, you had to be there. But it was one of the funniest moments. Was he OK? Well, he was, he was fine. He was he was he was fine. Yeah. Saw him the next morning at breakfast. He was fine. He did actually find the right room. So I think instinct instinct kicks in in those situations. You know, somewhere. The tapes must exist for the book. Yeah. Tales from the symbol bag. Yeah. I mean, that would be so fantastic to just hear as the oral dissertation and yes. history with him telling the stories because the book has definitely been uh you know adapted to a pg version of what these stories were really about and to hear him say with that accent oh man that would be the berries <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Peter, I just I want to interject for one second because um, my friend Chachi Lepret, who does a actually does a great Beatles show every week, mm. is asking if you might be able to share some recollections of being on the road with Steely Dan. Oh. Summer of ninety three, if I remember correctly. Ninety ninety three, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it, it was fun. Uh, I think. Uh, Donald Fagan was uh, hoping or anticipating that there'd be more jazz voodoo from me. Um, I treated it more like kind of a repertory gig. Uh, I just felt, you know, you got drum beats by Rick Morata, Steve Gadd, Jeff Percaro, Jim Keltner, uh, Bernard Purdy, uh, and, and forgive me for any other names I, I left out. Um, so I didn't feel a, uh, an urge really, or even a need to reinvent, uh, those things. And I was happy to try to just really, you know, play the tunes and, and, and it was interesting, um, looking out in the audience, sometimes I, I would realize I'd see, I'd see the you know the people and I, I said to my wife after one of the concerts, I said, nobody was there. She said, what do you mean? I said, they were all someplace else 20 years ago, you know, and 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 it felt good being part of that time machine for mm -hmm. people. I think yeah. uh, that was the most fun aspect. And my kids really got a kick out of it. Um, 
I think a lot more than than a lot of the jazz gigs. It was just it was very fun. The the size and scope of the tour. Um, uh, I mean, Adam Dig this. My drum tech Gary Grimm, uh, yeah. who was an extraordinary drum tech. I I got I got new drum heads every night. They changed the heads every day. Um, and he would he would do a little trick. Uh, I'd show up for the sound check and you know, doom doom, perfect doom doom, doom 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 doom. And, the, th and the, the second or third time he'd go, uh, play that again. Hmm. And I think what he what he would do is he'd get them all tuned perfectly. Then he would just like detune one lug in advance. So <laughs> I'd come play them and he'd go. Uh, uh, and every time I go, you're a genius. <laughs> yeah. What would I do without you? Yes. Um, oh, he's and, great. Uh, and and it, it was a terrific band. And uh, I, I think I have Walter Becker to thank for that. He, I think he was the one that kind of pushed uh, to get me into the group. Uh, but, you know, speaking about the jazz voodoo, I, I think Keith Carlock is the perfect drummer for them now because Keith not only can play such a rock solid great beat an exciting beat um but it has his uh, you know his own thing and he does come up with some pretty wacky stuff yeah uh, and and so i think he really turned out to be like the perfect guy as evidenced by you know he's played drums with them longer than than anyone else has yeah probably and 20 years now yeah wow that long i think it's close to that yeah well to be. he's and got He's got like the jazzer's point of view with that great pocket and that also that skank and you know, all those things that we love, you know, he's got it from the neck up. He's got it from the neck down. He's got it from the waist down, you know, all these elements working together. And uh, there's a fun factor in there too. Mm -hmm. And you feel yeah. that with Keith that's, I've always enjoyed his playing a great, great deal. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't think my my drumming was particularly fun. Yeah, and I think I, it was good. I think it was good. I wouldn't say it was fun. We have been th put in situations where people that we've loved and respected so much have created a certain template, and we kind of want to respect that. You, you know, I mean, Walter. Uh, was generally pretty cool, but but Fagan one day said to me, he goes, "Hey, why don't you approach this like you're Tony Williams and you just took some acid?" And I said, "Okay, I'll try." I said, "I just don't hear it that way, you know." Yeah, it's got to feel natural for what you do. Right, right. I I remember <laughs> it's it's different, but it was almost the same in a certain regard. I remember playing with Gil Evans Orchestra and we used to play Gone, that chart. Mm -hmm. It was on Miles, uh, Porgy and Bess. And basically that was not part of the entire repertoire of Porgy and Bess, but something that Gil had written and put in with this entire wonderful piece of work. And Philly Joe is on it. And the drum breaks he played, to me, I'd heard it so many times, that was part of the tune like this is what it is mm -hmm. and so when i was doing it i'm i can't get those out of my head yeah and i'm trying to play those breaks and then gil finally said to me one day he goes listen man that's your solo play what you want and i said i wish i could i just can't <laughs> get those things out of my head <laughs> it's like the guy's solo like when you hear Phil Woods on that Billy Joel tune. Yeah. That, that's just the solo, but it became such a part of the tune. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you had that love and respect for it. It's like, and then at the same time, you also have to have the irreverence to say, to hell with it. I'm going to do it. You know? Yeah. You know it, yeah. It, 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 it's a wonderful point, Adam. And, and, um, since we're talking about Miles and Gill, uh, uh, what's interesting is if you listen to uh, uh, Miles Ahead, um, which was the first collaboration with, with Miles and, and Gill, and Art Taylor's playing the drums on that. That's and, it. And what's, uh, 
what's outstanding is that uh, there are all these, uh, you know, big band 2D ensemble figures, and he doesn't prepare any of them. He doesn't cut any of them with the band. He just kind of this time playing glides through, and and if you hear anybody play that, and if they approach it like uh, you know, you know, do the typical big band drumming thing, it just doesn't sound right. You know, you 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 really have to. Uh, I th I think, yeah, you it, it doesn't call for um, reinventing the wheel. A lot of this stuff, uh, you know, you, you can't it, it can't get any better than than how these guys did it. Gil never gave drum charts to anybody. He mm. never gave you drum charts. He hired you. It's like, okay, bring your vibe, your feel. The band knows what to do. And, you know, Gil's thing was such, was primarily built upon the sonics and the orchestrations. You know, the way he put together sounds was stuff that people had not done before. And when you would be on the bandstand and you'd hear this gorgeous sound, then you'd look and you'd say, damn, it's a tuba, it's a French horn and it's a flute or a clarinet. It's like, how the hell did this come up with that sound? And you'd get chills. Mm -hmm. And um, I've done a lot of those Miles recreation things of playing the stuff from Porgy and Bass, Miles, I had different things. And I would always get chills just mm -hmm. from the sound, the way Gil put things together. It was another way of doing it because you know, it didn't need you to make all the hits and prepare. It was another way of doing it. And mm -hmm. amen for that. I mean, it's, it was yeah. swinging yeah. so hard. It's like, well, the band knows what to play. Just put down a good groove, you know? <laughs> I uh, okay. Just center the band, you know? They're going to lay, we got to land the plane, center the band, keep everything <laughs> together. They know what to do. Put the thing on it. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to tell a story that 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 toots my own horn, but I, I, I will just. Um, uh, this was, I think, my proudest moment in concert, and uh, uh, Terrence Blanchard and Sean Jones were were the two trumpet soloists, and we were, we were doing um, the poor game best part of the evening of this recreation of the Miles and Gill things. And was Vince that the NJ Pack thing? That we did it there but this particular evening was in uh, uh disney hall in los angeles okay um and that's a room I, I really do like to play uh so uh vince kind of just opened up the end of i think it was summertime and so it's chuck berghoffer just walking Ooh. and and i'm just playing ting 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 Ding, ding, ding. And and Terrence is a little bit of a distance from the drums. And he's and he's really tearing it up. And he's starting to play. He even looked at me a little bit like, "Come on, let's let's start mixing it up." And uh, I wouldn't budge. I wouldn't play anything other than the Jimmy Cobb beat. And all of a sudden, then he really starts playing. And this. This goes on for for quite some time, and um, that's all I would play was just that. And so the the fun part of it, I mean, and we, we, everyone was aware of, of this beautiful tension it's building, and 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 how cool it sounded. But afterwards, uh, so the place kind of erupts. Uh, the audience really dug it, and Terrence played just absolutely brilliantly. But the best thing, uh, John and Adam, was Terrence came over to the drums before he took a bow, and he grabbed my hand and 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 held it up, wow. like uh, like a prize fighters or something. Yeah. And I almost started crying. I was just, I was like, wow. It was. I just thought that was so gracious of him. That's a moment. Yeah. William yeah. Holden. William Holden. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, the undisputed you champ. Didn't give it up. You didn't give it up. You yeah. held it. And yeah. so it created the tension, you know, which was fantastic. Yeah, it's fun. Good fun. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, yep. you know, just what decisions we make in the moment, you know. 
William yeah. Holden. So, uh, <laughs> wow, the, the the world of uh, Susie Wong, right? That's... <laughs> many movies, many movies. Yeah. Hey, Pete, um, someone's asking, oh, Anthony uh, Amadeo is asking to tell the Hey 19 Tempo story. It's a good one. Oh. I know this story. Can you tell it? Is it? It's not a... Okay. Yeah. Sure. It's fine. I'm. And I'm. I'm not checking my my mail, but I'm going to open up my. Uh, okay. Some uh, good metronome, good comments my, here. My metronome map. So, uh, so with Steely Dan, uh, they weren't particularly fussy about you know the beats. Uh, although I, th as I mentioned, you know, Fagan was I think hoping for a little more of a leap of imagination from me at some point. Um, but uh, they were fussy about tempos. And we rehearsed for about three and a half weeks to get the right tempos for everything. I never rehearsed, you know, you know, Adam knows if, you know, we get three and a half minutes rehearsal for a jazz tour. We <laughs> were ahead of the game, you know. Um, uh, so, okay, we rehearse, we, uh, we get the perfect tempos. I mean, these guys at one point they were asking, like, can we do like 120.5? And we convinced them to stick with whole numbers. <laughs> so, um, so hey, hey, yeah. nineteen. Uh, the tempo for that uh, we settled upon was was one hundred and eighteen beats per minute. Yeah, I would have said one twenty. So, yep, okay, yep, one eighteen. I'm always rushing. Okay, that's my bandmates. <laughs> hey, nineteen. That's Reza Franklin. Duck, doom, doom, tick, doom, doom, duck, 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 duck. Okay. So all's fine and well. Um, we're about two weeks into the tour. We were uh, we were in Cincinnati, I remember. And the, the horn section was kind of pushing the tempo a little bit. Now I had I had uh, I I had made a, a cheat sheet of all the beats because I. You know, I wasn't that big of a Steely Dan fan, and I didn't know my old school from Bad Sneaker. I don't know what to. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I, I very neatly wrote the name of the tune, um, the, uh, the 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 beat, the basic beat. You know, so you you know, it's either going to be boom, pop, boom, boom, pop, boom, boom, pop, or it's going to be boom, pop, boom, boom, pop, boom, pop. You got a couple of shuffles. You got your Babylon sisters, and that's more or less it. Mm -hmm. and Sotfo, which was just its own thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you know, I, anyway, I got the right beat for the right song, and then I had the tempos, and and I think I I had laminated uh, uh, the sheet ultimately, or uh, uh, anyway, uh, the horns are pushing the tempo on 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 Hey Nineteen, so. I make an executive decision because I was counting off all the songs. I wasn't the mm -hmm. musical director, but I would do the clicking of the sticks. One, two, three, boom. So we changed the uh, the tempo in, in our Tama rhythm watch from 118 to 119. The only person that knew about this was Gary Grimm, the drum tech. Um, so, all right, so instead of deck, doom, doom, deck, doom, doom, deck, Dun, 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 dun. It would be so I changed it from 118 to 119. A19. Hey, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so the next day uh, we're in St. Louis and we get the sound and all the instruments and and Donald and Walter walk out onto the stage. They kind of saunter out. And Donald announces, uh, "Let's run um, Hey 19." And then he looks up at me, and uh, the drums are on the riser. He goes, uh, yeah, you know what? Felt kind of fast last night. I said, wow. Damn. That's impressive. And they, they said, what do you mean? I said, well, that's, uh, yeah. Uh, um, uh, that's impressive that you noticed. They said, well, did you do anything different? I said, well, I changed the tempo from, from 118, or I'm sorry, from, uh, yeah, from 118 to 119. Um, but that's amazing. You, you guys noticed and, and Faye going, yeah, yeah. He said, don't do that again. <laughs> so they didn't, um, 
Yeah, they didn't like their tempos. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don't do that again. Don't do that again. But, you're, you're, uh, hey, you know, and, and a singer, and Adam knows this, we've both worked with a lot of vocalists, uh, you know, the tempo that the vocalist wants is the right tempo. They've got to get the words out. And, uh, yeah. the, uh, you know, we don't, we don't appreciate, I think, everything that's, that's in play. Uh, when we're working with with a vocalist and um that's the the vocal is the most important thing when you're with a vocalist you gotta the thing i think of is you know maximum support least amount of activity that's right a good on. rule yep yep stay rule. out of their way uh, what do you think of this that's this is my new sight reading rule i think that is an excellent Excellent, because that's what you have to do. I just wish I was better at it. That's great. Yeah. This, I have to, it's kind of like this for me, you know? I think I get this on a hat, but not a red hat. What, what do you think? Maybe yeah. a blue hat? Not a red hat. Not a red hat. <laughs> a blue Maybe hat. A blue hat. The color is that of Adam's shirt would be perfect with, with that's, white letters. That's an yeah. amazing, that's almost like L.A. Dodgers blue. Yeah. That's an incredible shirt, Adam. Well, you don't see the stains on it with the angle that we're on right now. So good man. <laughs> hey, Pete, while I got you, uh, before I lose this comment from Mike Fasano, he's asking what your metron, what metronome app you use right now. And you just refer to that on your. Oh, well, I, 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 I like oh, to, that a metronome? I like to use polynome. Yeah. Um, this app is uh, just called pro metronome. It's just the simplest, you know? Okay. Uh, and, and also, um, there's another one called Tempo that's not bad. That's what I use, yeah. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, the Soundbrenner metronome, the wearable metronome, um, I like that. But, you, you know, Yamaha had a, had a metronome years ago. It was called the Click Station. And, boy, for working with vocalists, Adam, I don't know if you ever worked with this. It would... Uh, it had all your various uh, little slider faders for uh, different subdivisions, kind of like a, uh, a Dr. Beat uh, Roland device had. Mm -hmm. But the Yamaha had a tempo wheel. And, you know, kind of, well, I don't know, you know round, round wheel with a, a depressed or indented center. And um, if you just pressed your thumb on this plastic tempo wheel, you would get what they, they call the ha haptic, you know, bruh, 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 bruh. you get a silent uh, vibration or a buzz of the tempo. So, you know, you could, I, I notice if I ever finished a tune, especially if I was a little bit excited, and then I'm looking down at the metronome, and I'm trying to get a, 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 a read on this, it would be hard to really you know, and then and then you're looking at the vocalist and how soon do they want me to count this thing off? So with the click station, you could just kind of touch it, feel it, feel it. one, two, three, boom, and you always get the perfect tempo. Um, well, mm. Yamaha, I think you know it's 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 easy enough to go on the record and say Yamaha has made and they continue to make some of the greatest things that anyone's ever made in the history of the world. One of the things that Yamaha used to do, unfortunately, is that they would uh, prematurely discontinue some of these great things. And yeah. and that happened with the click station. And if you go on eBay and try to find one, they're like really expensive now. So um, creating an app that had this haptic thing, eventually it, it you know, it did happen. Um, but the, uh, the Soundbrenner watch... Uh, accomplishes this and it's 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 pretty great i see a lot of uh, you know music directors wearing these um if i'm using it for practice i like to wear it maybe around my ankle and not not on my wrist because of drumming um but i find having a uh, a click that i don't have to listen to and uh, especially because I, I don't like seeing my students cut themselves off even from a practice pad you know, they're just not aware of, of how hard they're hitting the tone. You know, you got to get a good tone on a practice pad. So uh, 
that's uh, sorry to go on about it, but that is a, a pretty cool metronomic solution. All things being said about metronomes, I I generally don't practice along with them unless I really want to work on my click chops or get something specific going. I like more to get the tempo from a metronome, turn it off, play, and then maybe I'll check back to see if, you know how how well I might have held tempo. Yeah. Sorry, that was a that was kind of a That was good. No, that that's great. That's a lot there. I like feeling that, that impetus. You know, it's it's one thing like if somebody was like tapping you or, or I think of that great story of Papa Joe smacking the newspaper when Duke was playing at Newport on that famous recording. He's standing next to Sam Woodyard and everybody talked about the girl dancing that was inspiring Paul Gonzalez to take more and more choruses. Meantime, Papa Joe is looking at it, at her. He's smacking the newspaper. He's... Sam Woodyard is challenging Papa Joe on the gig because he was there. <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh man, it's a far out story. Hey man, I I got uh, you just reminded me of a story that doesn't really have so much to do with drumming. We had a student at USC uh, who showed up for his jury. He was a saxophone player. Um, I apologize because I'm. I'm forgetting his name right at this very moment. Um, but he he was underprepared. And um, the chair of the jazz department at the, at the time said, you know, why are you forcing us to do this? I have to give you a bad grade. And uh, and I, I, I had a walk with him afterwards. I said, can I, can, you know, would you walk with me so we can have a little conversation? And I, I said, you know, by not taking care of business, you're just letting other people determine your future, your immediate future or your life. Now you've got a, a situation. You said your father's going to be very upset about this grade. And you allowed someone else to kind of mess with your scene. And it doesn't take that much to to uh, prevent something like that from happening. And you can do it, you know, kind of put my arm around them and hoped it would have a positive effect. Um, next jury. He shows up, he hands the transcription, it's the entire Paul Gonzalez solo. The oh. entire solo. All right, so we have pages. Yeah. He's memorized it. Wow. He starts playing along with the wow. recording. The, the, the magic of, of music and the magic of that solo what was incredible, Adam, was that he recreated what happened at Newport. Halfway through, we're all standing. The the panel of, of, of you know professors, the, the jury. <clears throat> we're pounding the table. We're screaming by the end of it. The you know the, um, and, and he recreated all that. The during, nuance, everything everything we it was stunning it was such a display of of you know and and he was he was graduating that year so it was it was such a a, right. a wonderful thing and and uh for anyone listening and and this is a, a huge mea culpa on my part but you know aside from you know i only had two duke records as i was growing up and i didn't really learn how to appreciate i I just didn't get around to it for some reason. I was l busy listening to a lot of different things, huge gaping holes in my listening education. But boy, the older I've gotten, the the just the more I cherish every chance I get to listen to Duke Ellington's band. Mm. What a what a great thing. Yeah. Mm. I um I just want to read a couple of quick questions, Pete, before they go away on my phone here. Um, two quick questions, Kevin Winard, and I think. The answer to this is no, but Kevin is saying, so Peter, you played the gig with a click every night, uh, referring to Steely Dan, but no, you just, you counted the songs with the yeah, metronome, I, but. Yeah. I counted them. Uh, on occasion, Kevin, I, I would keep it on because I, you know, we all had in-ears um, just, you know, just for fun. And 
I did a I did a tour a couple of summers later with Boz Skaggs, um, and I did most of that to click. Uh, Lincoln Schleifer was playing the bass, and he was way on the other side of the stage, and his time was so good he was <laughs> right there. Um, yeah. But I I was I was uh, I was relying a little bit on the click because I just really wanted to make sure that the that the tempos held and and. Um, uh, Boz had a had an arrangement of, of uh, I think "Can't Hide Love," the Earth, Wind, and Fire tune. That, you know, start. And you know, it'd be very easy to rush that if if you weren't careful. So, I wanted to make sure I could really get into the center. Of, of of the things and and I was doing the best Jeff Percaro imitation I could, you know, and 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 Lenny Castro was playing percussion. Oh man, yeah. And 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 it was a <laughs> lot of fun, and and Lenny was 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 really cool. But one night, I didn't imitate Jeff. I mean, I played something the way he would have played it because that's what he would have played. And, and you know what I mean? I wasn't imitated mm -hmm. all of a sudden. And, and I, I noticed something just slightly different, but Lenny right away, he turned as he was playing and he just started smiling and he, and he, and he <laughs> shouted over. He said, he said, now you get it. <laughs> I wish I could recapture that, but anyway, yeah. Um, uh, Steely That's Dan. I, I, in other words, when you listen to the uh, like Third World Man, there was uh, no. I, I wasn't using click on that. Mm -hmm. We got we got pretty pretty tempo uh, tolerant or intolerant. I don't know what the term would be. Um, yeah, you know, we all have our. You mentioned Will Will Lee was was watching earlier. I don't know if he's watching mm -hmm. now. Will. Will always had the magical ability not only to make everything you played feel better at the moment, but if, and it always happened with me, there'd be at some point during a take where I would either just kind of push a little the wrong way here. Or he would, he'd remember where it was and, and, and he would just say, uh, oh, I, um, hey, can I do one more pass to, to fix your part? But, and, and he would play it and, he would magically fix it by by what he played and it would always be so much fun watching him because he'd be seated playing and then when he would jump up from the chair doing his overdub you knew like wow okay now that's great oh, really that's going to be unbelievably great um i sure miss uh, those days when we got to work together so much but will if you're out there i love you and and miss you I think he still is, yeah, and and uh, and 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 we all love Will. I love Will. Yay. And speaking of speaking of bass players, um, Joey Scream has asked this. Joey Scream is a local drummer here in Boston. What it was like to play with Jocko? And I know we could take in a, a whole session, but is there any any uh, Jocko was was fun. Hard? Was fun. Um, yeah. uh, I think. The, the one advantage I, I had uh, when he heard me or, or, you know, luckily when he decided to recommend me was uh, I think Jocko and I had, had grown up listening to a lot of the same music. Um, and, uh, and, and, and Jocko was as informed by uh, uh, James Jamerson and Jerry Jamad and Chuck Rainey as he was by Ray Brown and uh, Ron Carter and um you know chuck berkhofer or uh max bennett or whoever might have been playing bass on uh, i dream of genie or mikhail's navy and i mean you know he loved tv uh he loved joel de bartolo's playing uh, from the tonight show band i mean he yeah yeah you know and <laughs> it's just the funniest thing um jocko would always reference the gig he had down in florida at the sunrise theater which was kind of Got to like partially get go into the Everglades to reach this theater in the round. Um, and Peter Graves' big band, or it was called the Peter Graves Orchestra. They were the house band, and 
and Jocko uh, played in the house band playing such acts as I think Bob Hope and Phyllis Diller. Um, and uh, whenever Joe Zavano would complain to Jocko that he was too loud on stage, because Jocko had these two acoustic 360 cabinets, you know, and Jocko would say, <laughs> Joe, he said, look, he'd point to his amp. Because it's the same setting I had when I, when I was backing up Phyllis Diller at the Sunrise Lounge or whatever <laughs> in Florida. He goes, I'm not too loud. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can hear that. I mean, yeah. Like, uh, it's looking like just a, a regular. It's, it's, yeah. it's the same setting. It's the exact setting I had when I was playing for Phyllis Diller and Bob Hope. I'm not too loud. <laughs> in this case one time one time we were we were mixing now I, I you know i was just watching but uh, joe and jock were producing one of these albums and um they reached a point it was this necessary detente they said all right we won't touch our own faders we're not going to make ourselves louder so joe hands off any of the the, the synth faders this is you know this is before automation and this we're they're mixing tape down to tape and uh uh so they 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 shook on it it was a deal uh but they did have subgroups so all the synths were on a, a master keyboard uh bass sax and drums so that they, they had these four group faders and jocko happened to be positioned kind of close to them so it's playing down, and, and I'm listening. I'm kind of digging it, and Jocko nudges me. And he goes, look. And there's Zavano, really, yeah, oh, yeah. And, and I can see he's pushing up his, you know, his profit or his Oberheim. And then Jocko kind of <laughs> indicates with his head, and Jocko's hand is on the, uh, the keyboard master, and he's just pushing it back. <laughs> And Joe's like, Joe's really digging it, you know, and he keeps pushing his faders up. And I just kept pulling it back. <laughs> I don't think we use that mix on the album. Oh, my God. You know, you played so much with Jocko, and you guys were such a, a fantastic team. And I think, you know, so many of the young bass players who were impressed by, you know, a lot of the flash that Jocko had, you know, they failed to realize that underneath whatever, he had a great beat. Mm -hmm. He had great functionary fundamental elements together. So he never sacrificed the function to mm -hmm. play all this other stuff. And so mm -hmm. many people, they just hear the frosting, they're missing the cake, yeah. you know? And this cat, you know, he was rocking. And uh, I was fortunate to get, you know, opportunities to play with him nowhere near as much as you. But we generally had a lot of fun playing together. He, and, I think uh, for, yeah, for any drummer, he was, it was fun. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, he had a serious woof. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. what you want, you know, he had meat in the beat. You know, when you, you could play with them i didn't you, you know you didn't have to worry you didn't have to work it's like you know that feeling when somebody is so there you don't even know they're there mm. well i always knew jocko was there but uh, well we know that <laughs> yeah but um, he, was a, he was a special one man i mean uh you know. what was what was uh uh the the one difficult thing of, of not being able to to play with him uh uh, the fretless uh, because his 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 intonation was was so good um that 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 became hard for me to uh, uh to hear anyone else play fretless no matter how good they were it's just uh you know i i uh i was probably unkind to to, to some bass players and at least in you know my internal voice because uh he he really uh, had an uncanny uh, lyrical, uh, as well as he was just so in tune right. when he played, and 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 that it, it was it was interesting because he uh, 
it's just a, it was just a, 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 a component of, of who he was. Yeah. They don't come along too often, people like this, you know? No, no, they don't. Yeah. Well, yeah. Tom, Tom Cohen was asking if there's a great weather report story. And we had talked about yesterday, Pete, you and I, about telling a, a Joe Zavonel story or, or weather report story. <laughs> if you, I, I mean, I, and you've, I've, and I just want to tell everybody watching this, if they don't know this already, and they should, Peter uh, authored a book 10 years ago. No Beethoven. Has it been 10 years? Not, Peter? Not, no, not, not about quite. Seven years ago. Seven years ago. Sorry. Okay. It came out. 2013. Okay. No Beethoven is an absolute must read. And there's lots of great uh, weather report anecdotes in there. But, oh, um, and you know what? A, uh, um, thank you for bringing it up. Hudson uh, Music, you know, their digital book mm -hmm. app and their store there. Uh, we prepared a multimedia version uh, just for their, their platform. And I oh, think fantastic. that's coming out very soon. Um, and so it's got, it's got, it's got video, it's got audio, it's got way more pictures. Oh, um, cool. Okay. Uh, there, there, of course, there's a Kindle version. There's an uh, audible.com, the audio version of the book. And uh, if you're into the iPad, uh, there's an I, iPad specific version. Um, yeah. I also made just a, a simple PDF version of, available at my website. So uh, in addition to the, the, the print version. Um, okay, the, the weather report story I'll, I'll, I'll tell. Um, let's see. I, uh, I, I'm new in the band. Um, and I'm uh, invited to listen to one of the songs that they were mixing uh, for the album Mr. Gone. And um, this was a track that Tony Williams had played on. It was, uh, uh, it, it was a tune, I think it was the tune Mr. Gone. Um, now, uh, what a lot of people don't know is that, you know, Tony uh, went into the studio and, and cut two tracks and Tony wasn't satisfied just you know, his memory of how he had played. And he came back down to L.A. with his drums at his own expense and re-recorded those tracks for for Joe Zavon on the band. Oh. It didn't charge him anything. It just, you know, he, he wanted, to, wanted to redo them, which I always thought was pr pretty amazing. Um, and... Uh, Anyway, Tony, Tony was great, and when I got to meet him by way of Weather Report, he was he was always like super gracious and, and really nice. So, um, anyways, uh, I go to the studio. This was the Devonshire Studios. This is the summer of 1978, and um, uh, PG uh, warning. There's uh, a little bit of bad language with this story and, and, and the mention of drugs. Uh, Jocko had taken down uh, a framed gold album, you know, framed with glass, and uh, he'd set it down, and he set it on the, uh, the counter of, of the mixing console. Now, mixing consoles, uh, particularly this one, it was an MCI console, had kind of a, a, an angle or a slant to it uh, where the faders... Uh, where I, I, I seem to remember, did, would, it be, would it have been slanted? Yeah, part part of it was slanted. Anyway, there, uh, uh, there are the faders, and then there's like a slant, and then the faders, uh, and then a padded mm -hmm. elbow rest. So um, imagine this is the size of an album. Jocko has, has got it set like this, so it's level. But, you know, between the angle and this padded elbow thing. So it's, 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 it's hanging over like this. Um, now, Zavano says, you can sit in the producer's chair. So I'm like, well, cool, you know. So I sit in the chair, and um, I don't even take notice of this album cover. By the way, it, it had freshly uh, 
uh, chopped and sorted uh, lines of, of the drug cocaine. Um, so anyway, it's it's there, and there, uh, Jocko had, had had put it there. Uh, Joe uh, allows me to sit in the producer's chair, and I lean back in this producer's chair like, wow, this is pretty cool. And, uh, of course, I cross my legs. And I... <laughs> Woody so Allen! I, I do right. a total Woody Allen. So this thing goes yeah. flying in the air, and and all, all this cocaine drops onto the parquet floor. Oh, gosh. I hear, I hear the tape go, you know, the tape was playing. But it stops, two-inch master tape. And the engineer of all people, uh, no longer with us, uh, Alex Casanegras, I, I, I believe that's who was engineering. Yeah, I, in fact, I know it was. He stops the tape, and he's the first one to say anything, and he yells across the room, you motherfucker. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. So now I'm down on my hands and knees, desperately trying to like find any of this. It might still be on the floor, <clears throat> pick it up. And wondering if any of it got into the uh, you know the the shag carpeting or, or I you oh, know man. I'm just thinking, okay, you dummy, you really messed up. You know, you're gonna get fired, you're gonna get fired. You're gonna get fired. Um Anyway, later that, that day in the hallway, Jocko ran into me. He goes, um, hey, uh, man, you, you, you have uh, $70 you can loan me? <laughs> yeah, okay, sure. Loan? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So that was, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, there are plenty of stories anyway. That was. Uh, how are we doing for time here? Still we're here. Still well, here. We're still here. We've got a long time, and, and I know you guys probably want to wrap it up. I thought maybe, Adam, you could tell a quick road story for uh, – because you, you've been on the road a bit, young fella. Where do you begin? Oh, I mean, there's – it's it's so hard when you just put me on a spot to think of one. Um, that's tellable. Yeah, yeah that's tellable. To think about the audience <laughs> okay. and all the uh, tactics of life. <laughs> Tell one on yourself. Well, there's been uh, numerous situations. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you one of my first situations. I was in New York and, um, you know, you kind of consider certain clubs places where it's a, like a rite of passage to play in a place. Like the first time, like for a classical musician, you know, you play Carnegie Hall, that's a big feather in your cap. You know, first time I played the Village Vanguard, I was so excited. And uh, before, I think it was in the mid seventies, probably around 77, 78, I'm playing at uh, this club called Boomers which used to be on Bleecker Street. It was called Boomers because the two guys that owned it were Bob Cooper and Mel somebody. So it was Boomers. So I'm playing in there and it, I'm playing with uh, Bob Moover. That reason didn't make any sense to yeah. me. <laughs> but Boomel, Boomer. Boomel, right. Yeah. It became Boomers instead of Boomel. Boomel, okay, yeah. And. Uh, so I'm playing in there with a Bob Mover, the player, uh, alto player, Calvin Hill. I think James Williams' first gig in New York, the piano player. And uh, Jeff Stout, trumpet player from Boston. So I'm there playing, and, and Art Blakey comes walking by me. And I've known Art Blakey from just being on the scene there. And I'm like, I'm playing, and it's like, oh, shit. And he comes by me, and... He was so wonderful. He goes, you're playing your ass off. Thank God he Man. said this to me. Yeah. Because two minutes later, Mingus and Sonny Rollins came into the club together. Now, if he hadn't said that, I probably would have folded <laughs> just falling off the chair. Yeah, yeah. But it was just what I also find so great gratifying was how gracious these elders were mm. and supportive 
because these were our yeah. heroes. Yeah. And when they would come in and say something like that, man, that was worth more money than anything. You know, it, you can't put a you right can't on. put a price on how supportive they were and gracious. And uh, you know, there's just so many situations like that where you know, these were like our fathers, you know, and whoever's left on Father's Day, I still call them up, man. I'll call up Jimmy Cobb. I'll call up Jack. I called up Roy this past year, wished him happy birthday. And I go, That's how great, you man. feeling, Roy? Happy birthday. And I go, it's this one. He goes, yeah, this mom, yeah, yeah. And I go, how you doing, Roy? He goes, I feel good. No, 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 no. And he said, <laughs> oh, I man. feel good. 94 wow. years old. And then I go, wow. Roy, God bless you, man. Thank you. Thank you for all your inspiration and just everything. And he goes, ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. <laughs> I mean. Yeah. It's, I mean, of I, course, I can hear it. Yeah. It. We have these adventures of debauchery and things like that that have occurred along the way. And things that may have happened when they happened were terrifying and terrible. But when you think back on them now, you laugh and you just are so grateful. Well, we got through that one. <laughs> <laughs> I would. Uh... Uh, I don't uh, stop me, Adam, if you don't want me to tell this story about the uh, about the restaurant pub in England. Um, I was glad we got out of that. Uh, we were on tour. I was playing uh, with the, the trio with John Taylor and Pally Danielson, right. and you were playing with John Abercrombie and Dan Wall. And it right, was a fine right. tour, and so the two bands would ride the bus together, and we had a, a, a late morning leave um i'd been down to the breakfast room early as adam had been and and uh, just off the lobby was uh was the pub and and somehow i don't know if we thought we might go there for coffee uh and there was pally danielson and and, and pally uh, had missed breakfast but he could get something to eat in the pub so as we're waiting to to leave maybe it was a 12 noon leave uh, uh, we we uh, join Pale, who's uh, going to get something to eat, and he's trying to decide what to eat. He was looking at the menu, and you were there, and he decides to uh, get some kind of an Indian curry dish uh, that that they offered. And, and we thought, what? what did I do now? Oh gosh, a, 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 good, a good hearty breakfast. So uh, Adam excused himself to go up to his room to get his suitcase and his, his carry-on bag. Um, and we're, we're seated there with Pally, and Pally's food uh, is delivered to him. Meanwhile, uh, two guests come in to the bar. Am I okay to... Uh, uh, yeah. and, I can't even remember this story. Okay. It, it, I, it, so, uh, so it's a little bit of an l shape type thing so the hotel you take a few steps down and and pally seated kind of at the the, the apex of this this corner of this l shape and down at the end of the bar are uh two gentlemen uh who are wearing turbans and um one of them had a, had a fiercely uh a trimmed beard a, a, a very impressive uh, looking mm. guy a suit thing so I'm guessing they were uh, Sikhs. Um, and uh, they're at the end of the bar having a private conversation and uh, drinking a cocktail. And, uh, anyway, Adam uh, comes in the, the hotel doorway, doesn't see these two guys, and he sees Pale with his plate of Indian food. And before anyone can catch Adam's attention, as he starts coming down the stairs with his bag, we hear him go, Papa dum, papa dum, papa dum, and, and we're like, mm, mm, no, mm, you, you got to get your Cody in a hoodie. Yeah. Oh, jeez. So you're doing the papa dum, and these two guys, and I'm like, what? Um, oh man, but, but definitely the like the if looks could kill, kind of look. Yeah. Yeah, and and Adam senses, of course, like 
because we all are now kind of frozen. And he peers around the corner and he sees you too. He goes, oh, he goes, sorry, gentlemen. <laughs> or or it's like, excuse me, fellas, or something. Yeah, it was like, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, it was it was sincere enough that they were kind of like, yeah, okay, fine, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible I haven't been killed yet, actually. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's all innocent stuff. I've... We, and no offense to anyone who uh, yeah. heard the story. It was a different time. Uh, uh, yes, right. it was a different time. It was. It was. It was. Uh, Peter, I just quick question. I know you guys are <clears throat> want to get going here. Um, are you working on a, any new apps? Has been a question asked. Ah, uh, apps. Um, the apps. Uh, the, the, the absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Right, thank you. Um, the. Uh, uh, the apps at this. Uh, who, who asked this question, by the way? Uh, Anthony Cusina. Okay, Anthony. Um, so the apps that Anthony uh, would be referring to are these uh, play along apps that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, we started off uh, with uh, two volumes called Jazz Essentials, volumes one and two. And uh, these were created uh, not only as karaoke for horn players or vocalists or vibes players, or whoever. Uh, but you could also go into the uh, the mixer and either mute or change the volume of the piano, the bass, or the drums. And it was the a selection of like the the ten standards that every player needs to know. And then we had ten more jazz tunes that's uh, uh, very similar to songs like Record of May, Blue Bassa, um, etc. Uh, for for people to play with, um, we then did a uh, an Afro Cuban app uh, with uh, uh, Aron Serfati put that together with Omar Ruiz. It's really killing Afro Cuban app. Um, then we did the Bob Mincer Big Band app, uh, which is like really amazing. We did ten tunes and. Any other big band play along I'd ever seen, you, you could maybe take out the lead trumpet, maybe the lead alto in various parts of the rhythm section. But I figured not everybody maybe wants to work on just being a lead trumpet player. So you, we have first trumpet, second trumpet, first trombone, bass trombone, alto, tenor, baritone sax, and then all the rhythm section instruments that you can mute, you can change the volume of, you can solo if you just want to hear how uh, one of these players and the really, you know, Los Angeles's finest musicians. Mm -hmm. um, and recently we just came out with a Brazilian play along app and we hope to get a second volume. This was put together by a quartet uh, in Sao Paulo um, called the BRS Quartet. And they're all really uh, like amazing players. And uh, that's a lot of fun to play along with. So yeah, we have Jazz Essentials 1 and 2. Afro-Cuban, the new Brazilian app, and the Minter Big Band app. Uh, aside from the next Brazilian app, if, if we get that delivered to us, uh, I don't see anything else yet. Um, the Big Band app was uh, a, a pretty big undertaking. Uh, it's another way of saying it was really expensive to do. So um, uh, the apps are there, and... and uh, I'm noticing a lot more customer support, and I wondered, has uh, has Apple changed something? Is there some update that we're not aware of? And my developer, Lucas Ives, who's a genius, uh, he said, I think it's more just that, you know, with COVID now, a lot yeah. more people have a lot more time just to <laughs> mess with the apps. Uh, but uh, rest assured, the apps are working great. Um, you can um, uh, you can make you can record within the app uh, and, and then make a mix of that and send it to your teacher, your friends. Uh, um, so uh, it, it, it at least provides some form of ensemble playing. And um, I, I, I play along with a couple of those. Uh, I think on YouTube you can find some mm -hmm. demos of me doing that. Fantastic. All right. Um, I, I was just going to say, um, anybody who's watching me, that's my beautiful Rogers kit in the background there. It's a 1966, I believe, holiday kit that I bought from 
uh, local drummer friend of mine, Tom Evans, who I think has been watching. And uh, what inspired me to want to buy a set of Rogers drums at, at this point in my life was the maestro. I'm pointing to Peter. Am I pointing to Peter? Uh, and so Peter has his Rogers kit set up in his studio. And we had talked earlier before we were live about him playing them for us. This and is a... a I've asked about this. 1965 holiday kit. Uh, it had never been played when um, Steve Maxwell uh, found it, offered it for sale. And even on his wonderful YouTube page, when he was describing it, he wouldn't play it. He said, it's never been played. I'm not going to play it. Um, so uh, aside from uh, a couple of rusty parts here and there, just from the moisture over the years, um, here they are. <laughs> Cha-cha-cha. Yeah, Pete, yeah. I got to tell you, you'll, they sound great through the, you know, through the, uh, the there's Zoom. My Tama, there's my Tama kit. And that's where I do all my recording and, and stuff. And my, I've got two computers in here. and I'm just a very lucky guy. But, yeah, they're, they're, they're so much fun to play. They sound good? They sounded great. No, and that, that was just the acoustic drums. There were no, there was no mic input into the Zoom thing because I'm That's controlling it. My, my Zoom uh, Q2N4K, which makes the experience of Zooming, the other Zoom, uh, just so much better. Um, I have to uh, learn how to use my Zoom camera for a uh, camera and oh, microphone. It's the best. It's the best. Yeah. Zoom and then I, uh, hmm? Are you using a Zoom camera? You using one too, Adam? Great. Yeah, yeah, I've got, I've just got this. Well, let's do a little quick Zoom promo since we love Scott and everybody, David Vi at Zoom, because they're so good to us. There I you just go. got That's this. All you need. Yeah, it's, they Q8. work amazing. Um, um, but, but when I do record those drums, um, I uh, I don't know if you can see them from here. I've, I've, I've got, I've got two uh, vintage Sony mics uh, and uh, the same one for the bass drum so i've just got these three there you go look at that that's the h1n that's the audio point and shoot set it and forget it and it's rocking yeah it's always with me smart I don't leave home without it there you go yeah the the zoom and is zoom is is the deal and and it, it's made teaching just a, a much more not only rewarding but uh, you know accurate mm -hmm. method. I I was using something called Calabra. Um, I don't know if there are other similar type uh, products, but uh, is that pharmaceutical? No, no, no. This was this was created um, I think initially as as sort of a practice compliance platform for music teachers. Um, but it allows uh, a teacher to review uh, a student's, you know, the practicing is time stamped and you can, you can just kind of check in with your students um, throughout the, let's say the week or however mm -hmm. wow. uh, much time. Uh, and this is different, you know, cause I, I do teach at artist works and that's that they have a proprietary video exchange system. Uh, Collabra doesn't do that, but Collabra, is a good way for students to document what they're doing. Um, you know, I, I have no problem with, with the students preparing something and recording it and posting it, as opposed to like, you know, you have to be able to play it on demand. Um, these are stressful enough times as it is, and, and, and there's enough stress and, and I think uh, skill that, that's required to record something. I mean. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's what we've learned how to do after all these years is to record something that someone else can enjoy. So um, I, I think as as far as teaching goes, we're all going to be um, 
enjoying the evolution of of uh, maybe some product innovation and and the tips that get shared uh, amongst various teachers and such um this would be you know i mean john you're you're these 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 twice a week podcasts are, are great maybe um you can collect some of the the comments and 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 if it's not too boring um uh, if adam wants to come back i know i'd love to come back sure, uh, i'd love to have you guys we, come can, back. we yeah. can address things if people still have questions and yeah. gee, you're inspiring maybe i'll i'll do that i did it uh, the, did you see the one I did a, a little while ago the, for International Jazz Day? I didn't see that. I saw the brush thing the other day that Vic Firth, or uh, I think it was Vic Firth, did. Yeah, Adam and I were watching it. So check this out. So I was, you know, Zoom, and, and I was trying to integrate my artist work setup, and we're trying different platforms, and, and we're just running into the issues. And, and my engineer was helping me from across town. And I gave him control of my computer. So finally, I said, well, what if I just use my iPhone for the for the video? And we pump my whole Pro Tool setup, which actually sometimes is my Logic setup, which is actually sometimes my Luna setup, the uh, <laughs> universal audio, uh, because there's there's no latency with, with the Luna because I, uh, I, I use okay. universal audio interfaces. Um, anyway, it's getting complicated, but, uh, I, I took, I took a stereo out from, from my recording setup and through an Apogee duet was able to plug into the iPhone. And so I used the iPhone video, which connected easily, you know, cause there's the Facebook app. Yeah. And then, uh, for the audio, it just, it automatically accepted the input from and 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 we could we could check the levels on the apogee duet to make sure that we weren't overdriving the iphone or the facebook system and boy the comments i got people just love the sound of the drums and 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 the iphone looks you know pretty darn good it does uh, yeah if there's a way i can do that using the q2 it was, in other words i was i was avoiding the 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 zoom thing because sometimes I don't know if it's a bandwidth issue. Sometimes the drums don't sound particularly great yeah. on the yeah. Zoom internet platform. Uh, so I, I don't know. This would be fun to maybe workshop because, uh, like it or not, I think this will be the reality for a while and that we so. may have to continue much of our interactions and in teaching mm -hmm. uh, due to the need to uh, uh, be socially distant. Now, I don't want to get up on a, on a soapbox of any type, but um, I got some comments. I, I made a video that said, stay at home, and some people thought I was being political, which struck me as odd. Because I, I think if I'm being anything, it's, it's just I'm trying to just be socially kind of conscious and aware. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, uh, yeah. I don't give a fuck who you voted for. It's, it's a matter of not only not infecting yourself, which people think that they have the right to do but you don't because you you risk infecting others um and you know if it's just because you know you feel like your freedoms are being violated because you can't get a fucking tattoo or you can't go bowling or you can't go to the wiener schnitzel or some shit mark maron had a, had a particularly good bit on this last week um come on yeah, yeah. it's 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 uh, it's, it's something bigger at stake, and I, I and I've seen some people I know really go down the rabbit hole of of of, of shit, and it's um, you know talk to any anyone who's on the front lines, any any of the the, the doctors and nurses, um, you you know you don't want to mess with this thing. This is some serious business, and and yeah. Yeah. We, we we all have a responsibility to life to stay healthy. Do unto others as you would want done unto you. Yeah. Right. Show them the appropriate consideration, sense of humanity. You right. Know, it ain't about me. It's about we. And we all have to consider that. Yep. You know? I mean, I always thought that yeah. way about the bandstand. Yeah. It's real life here. And the bandstand is real life, but real life is the bandstand now. So 
all these things are kind of working in conjunction. And yeah, inter we have interwoven. To understanding yeah. that. And and for anyone that that, that goes to the uh, really annoying cop out, you know, stick to music, or stay in your lane. Uh, number one is uh, I'll. I enjoy sticking to everything I'm sticking to. Uh, but number two, you can look to Adam Nussbaum or you can look to me. And if, and if you can judge our lives as having been successful in terms of our work, it's because we take care of the bandstand, because we, th we see the big picture, we take care of the tune. And, it, and just like he said, it's about we, it's not about me. When it was about me, my drumming sounded like shit. Right? So... Um, yeah, we're qualified to, to, to talk about it just from that point of view alone, I think. Okay, I got political. <laughs> sort of. Well, I don't even think you got political. I think you were just, I think you were just making good sense. You know what I mean? And, and, I, and I won't go there either because I've had this conversation and, I, and people look at it like it's, but it's not political. It's just like, look, we're just, we're doing what the experts are telling us. And, that, and, and we've gone a long time and we'll, yeah, always be looking ahead. You guys, this has been great. I'm going to end the stream uh, so we can say goodbye to everybody. But I won't end the chat just yet. So we can all I say goodbye. I want to thank you guys for bringing me in so I could bogart on your big party. <laughs> thanks for letting me join the jam. It Adam, was fun. Yeah, thanks for fitting us in your schedule, brother. Thank you. <laughs> no, this is great. This has been Bye, great. Everyone. Peter, thank thanks, you. John, thank you. I love You're the welcome. show, by the way. Oh, thank. Yeah, well, I, at some point on the next one, I want to ask you um, where you were in 64. You were not quite 10 and you were not quite nine. Matt, I know your I, ages. I, I, I saw the Beatles. Um, Ed and, Sullivan. And, and then we had, I remember we had a talent show and, and my aunt found some Beatles wigs because those kind of became popular very quick. Yeah, yeah. And and we we just I remember the four of us got up there. We just sang yeah yeah yeah, and the curtain opened yeah 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 yeah, and the, uh, mercifully the curtain closed again. <laughs> um, Think a little I, funny, Adam, because I used to I used to I used to uh, I used to wonder. I'd I'd see the Beatles and 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 you know and and Ringo is perfect and 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 I get that. But in the very beginning, I have to admit, I would watch them and I used to wonder. Boy, what would they sound like if like Elvin was playing with them? <laughs> if, like Grady Tate was playing. Them. Yeah. <laughs> Ringo was the right guy for the job. He was. He, he was. was. He Absolutely sure was. was. Absolutely. God bless him. All yeah. of them. And, yeah. and, boy, the Ed Sullivan show. But yeah, the Beatles are great. Okay, real quick, your favorite Beatles tune, Adam. Man, Come where on. do you begin? There's so many. It's one. unbelievable. Come on. Come on. Right. I don't mine, know. Mine Paperback is... Rider had a good groove. Yeah. Okay. Paperback Rider. Yeah. Okay. That had a hip yeah. little groove that I found enticing, you know? Yeah. From, yeah, Paperback Rider was, was that Rubber Soul or was that Revolver? It was one of those back then. Revolver. Yeah. Mine, yeah. believe it or not, is one of their poppiest, most commercial, others would say even sappy songs, but I love Let It Be. I love it. I love the beauty of the vocal, the piano part, everything, <clears throat> everything. So Billy Something Preston. Something George Harrison. I mean, yeah. wow. All right, boys, I'm going to end the stream. Oh, wait, I, didn't get, I didn't get to tell you mine. Oh, Peter, sorry. Sorry. Yes. Penny Lane. Oh, yeah. But you know, it's funny. I got a turntable recently and just out of the blue. Uh, what? So what's one of the first records I order? I just Sergeant Pepper. No, Rubber Soul. Rubber Soul. Rubber Soul. And um, and it's amazing. But then the other album I ordered, because I watched this movie, I, I, I never had a copy of Pet Sounds. Oh, yeah. And, wow. Okay. The drum beats are, um, you know, what Brian yeah. Wilson came up with. And, and you know, how, how Blaine was, you know, credited with this out of the other. But I think just that recording alone, was, uh, they're drum beats unlike anything I've ever heard. Yeah. But we'll, yeah, okay, I think the next time we do this, let's, let's, let's talk about the 60s. Yes. Because there's a few recordings that would be really fun to talk about. Uh, and I'll save it for 
next time. Okay. All right. That's a great idea. We'll we'll have a more formalized plan than than you know just kind of winging it. And we've done the winging, then we'll do a, a more structured thing. All right. To be continued. To be continued, gentlemen. All right. I'm going to end the stream, but don't go away, boys. I'll see you in a second. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'll probably do this again Saturday, I think. And uh, I don't know. We'll figure it out then. All right.